Arsenal have got themselves back on track after getting their first victory in five league games as they smashed three goals past an informed Nottingham Forest side. So from Mikel Arteta's surprise tactical rotations to the impact of the returning Martin Odegaard and Ricardo Calafuri, Arsenal's new star boy shining once again and a major twist in the title race. As per, let's break it all down and discuss the five things we learned from Arsenal 3 Nottingham Forest New. Yo, what is going on guys? My name is Buzz14, welcome back to your boys channel and how nice is it feel to finally get a victory? Thanks to Com Ave for sending your boy to the game to watch that masterclass live. We're gonna break everything down as per, so smash a like if you enjoy and subscribe to the channel if you are new. Helping your boy Andrew to 300,000 subscribers. But starting off with Mikel Arteta's rotations. Going into a game that many fans agreed was absolutely must win. After four league games at Arteta, the pressure was building on Mikel Arteta. So with news breaking hours before the game, that Timber, Calafuri, Marino and Saka were all starting, a lot of Arsenal fans were anticipating a very strong 11. But come the official lineup, Mikel Arteta threw a major surprise. In came both Jorginho and Gabriel Jesus, with Havertz, Martinelli, Rice and Partey all on the bench. For Havertz, it was the first time being on the Arsenal bench since all the way back on January the 30th. Rotating in a game that had so much pressure, this was really bold for Mikel Arteta. But at the same time, isn't this what fans have been asking for? With a squad of players full of so much experience, different sorts of profiles like Jesus and Jorginho, Mikel Arteta was finally making the most out of his squad, realising this game was always going to be about the control against a forest side that is deadly on the counter attack. Arsenal keeping possession was going to be absolutely vital. To have then ended the game with 66% possession, 62 final third entries and a 3.6 respect effect created, alongside a whopping 68% of the field tilts. The control was indeed delivered by a certain Italian in midfield. Jorginho is starting his third league game for Arsenal this season. In 45 minutes, he had 29 accurate passes, one key pass and two accurate long balls. And if it wasn't for a yellow card, he definitely would have stayed on the second half. But what we can talk about is the tempo they gave the Arsenal midfield, slowing the game down to its own pace. It's something that Jorginho is a master at, dictating exactly how the game needs to be played. Not only did it help Arsenal sustain pressure, but against a very compact forest side that had only spent 103 minutes training all season, Arsenal were able to pick passes through the lines and find the likes of Martin Odegaard. At 32 years of age and out of contract at the end of the season, while I don't think he's a long-term answer for Arsenal, his experience is still going to be vital this season. As we saw last in the absence of Thomas Partey, stepping up with man of the match performances against Liverpool and Newcastle, with a need for control going into the future against the blocks, games coming thick and fast, Declan Rice and Thomas Partey are both amazing at what they do. But in Jorginho, Arsenal have that something different. The control of a Pep Guardiola-esque midfielder. This performance was a reminder to Arsenal fans. But what about Thomas Partey coming on the second half? A 7.7 .7 rating, 45 minutes played and a fantastic goal scored. Completing 97% of his passes, winning 4 out of 5 ground balls. Scoring his second Arsenal goal of the season, it was yet another solid performance. And they showcase the depth that Arsenal have in the number 6 area. A strong performance was Jorginho, followed by Thomas Partey, not even using Declan Rice off the bench. But in terms of the Arsenal line, Mikel Arteta also had another surprise. Giving Gabriel Jesus only a second start of the season, starting as a centre forward and dropping a 6.8 rating, playing all 90 minutes, with one off target shot all game, two key passes, only one ground to one. He was dropping deeper, trying to get himself involved, it was an awful performance. But the issue for Jesus is he's playing for his Arsenal career, £265,000 a week, the second highest Arsenal earner. In 2022-23, he deserved that money. But fast forward to 2024, and he doesn't have that same level of confidence driving past players. A lack of a birth, maybe down to all the injuries. His versatility is still going to be very important going into this season. And with him being a player all about confidence, a goal in the Premier League could change so much. With his last league goal being against Forest all the way back on January the 30th. One league goal so far in 2024, things aren't looking that good. But for Raheem Sterling, they certainly are, with a 7.0 rating coming off the bench. In 13 minutes, getting his first ever Arsenal League assist, with 7 touches and 1 key pass. He now moves up to 17th in the Premier League all-time goal and assist list, with 186 to his name. Showing fantastic passion as he assisted Ethan Wanieri. He may only be a loan transfer, but I definitely sense a bit of pressure that is building towards him. What Arsenal fans are looking for, of course, is a Sterling of Man City. A player that thrived on the left-hand side and scored so many goals and assists. With all the uncertainty of who is Arsenal's current best left winger, if Raheem Sterling can find form, rhythm by starting more games and building more momentum, I wonder if Mikel Arteta can once again unlock that form that we saw at City. Moving on to the second thing, the returning heartbeat. So you're telling me when Arsenal have their captain fully fit and available, we're a far better side. What a surprise. Martin Odegaard making his first Emirates start in a very long time, as Arsenal produced a 1.5 XG, limiting Forrest to only 0.46. The XG wasn't even that high, but it was a difference in terms of our performance. The fluidity in that final third and the tempo, it's all because Arsenal had their glue back. 
their heart beating attacking Martin Odegaard. After a performance against Chelsea where he was definitely not fully fit, Odegaard said I hadn't been training as normal before the Chelsea game. I didn't feel like I was ready to go away with Norway in the international break and to play again so soon. But come round to this game, he was definitely fully firing and ready. Dropping an 8.2 rating and getting one assist. With 60 accurate passes, 6 key passes, 3 successful dribbles and 5 ground walls won. Erdogan created more chances himself than the entire Nottingham Forest team. And we can sit here and talk about his connection alongside Bukayo Saka, assisting the opening goal and playing a major part. But for me, it's more about how he sets the rhythm. In that final third against his defensive sides, Erdogan's bravery on the ball and ability in those tight spaces, the little flicks, the little one-twos, it's a killer for opposition sides. Not only allowing Arsenal to be far more fluid, Erdogan is Arsenal's reference point in that final third. The one player that wants the ball every single time to find players in behind. That is now two assists in two games since returning, as Arsenal's overall performance also improves. There was talk when he was out injured if Arsenal were missing it. Wins against Spurs and nearly against City. But in those recent games against Newcastle and Inter Milan, a fully fit Martin Erdogan could have made a major difference. This was a far more functional Arsenal performance, almost 22-23-esque, not just because of Martin Odegaard though, but also because of Ricardo Calafiori. Returning to the Arsenal side after injury and dropping a 7.0 rating, with two clearances and two tackles, two out of two ground balls won, he also completed 26 accurate passes and a total of 90%. And that's the thing I want to focus on. As sound as he is defensively, and it was definitely a very underrated performance, it's more about his ability on the ball going forward. So quick to release the ball and give Arsenal urgency. Every time Calafuri gets the ball, you sense the Arsenal team comes alive. What they see is a Maverick playing a left back that's able to drive forwards and get his team higher up the pitch. One thing that people don't understand about Mikel Arteta as defenders, of course defending is always the first priority, but they are also functional parts of the Arsenal attack, playing integral parts of the build-up phase to get the ball forwards, but also in that final third not scared to receive the ball in the half spaces. Try to make things happen and make the opposition think that little bit more. This was Calafuri's first game back from injury and it was quite a performance playing a total of 67 minutes. As Calafri said after the game, I don't feel like I'm tired, but for sure I've missed some games. But then the stadium gave me the energy. It was an amazing performance by everyone. We really enjoyed the game. Alongside Yuri and Tim, but Martin Odegaard and Calafri are the Arsenal players that set the rhythm. Having these three players available, with all these important games that we have coming up, their availability is going to be absolutely massive. Moving on to the third thing, Bukayo's new level. On a day where Arsenal got their first victory in five league games, for me, it was the star boy that was shining the brightest. A 9.0 rating and a man of the match performance, with one goal and one assist. Two successful dribbles, four key passes and one big chance created. Think about the way he struck that opening goal, combining with Martin Odegaard and smashing the ball into the back of the net. Arsenal attempted a total of 11 shots in that first half. Eight of those were attempted or created by Bukayo Saka, with five shots and three chances created. It was a performance of a player that knew that Arsenal had to win. Energised by the return in Martin Odegaard, the Arsenal right-hand side was really fluid. For Bukayo, that is now 12 goals and assists in 11 games this season, more goal contributions than games, having contributed in 8 of 11 games this season. It's at the Emirates Stadium where this guy is reaching a brand new level, with six games, four goals and four assists. With a total of eight, there is no player in the Premier League that has more goal involvements than Bukayo Saka this season. You think about some of the performances and the ratings. 9.9 .9 against Southampton, 9.4 against Leicester. That crucial goal against Liverpool where he was barely even fit. His numbers are getting very impressive. With now more Premier League goals than Cesc Fabregas, he's also got 43 Premier League assists, which has now won more than the gaffer Mikel Arteta. Becoming the only player in the Premier League since the start of last season, with 20 plus goals and 15 plus assists, alongside 120 plus chances created. He was compared to Phil Foden, he's compared to Cole Palmer, but right now he's gone gun for gun for the best shooters in the Premier League, joining only Salah and Haaland to have got over 60 goals and assists in the last three Premier League seasons. That has now 8 assists so far this season, the highest in the league, with 35 in the last 4 seasons. He's only behind Mo Salah, who of course is always going to be the reference point. One of the all-time greatest Premier League wingers that is still firing for Liverpool. For Bukayo Saka, that is the level that he is trying to reach. An undisputed world-class player, trying to become the best in the league. One of Bukayo Saka's best traits for me is his passing appreciation. It's not only the fact that he always completes his passes, but it's the way the players are able to receive the ball. Bukayo has a fantastic understanding of weight of passing, forming a formidable partnership on the right-hand side with a certain Yuri and Timber, who himself was about to score his first ever Arsenal goal, if it wasn't for Marino being an inch off side, but his performance was very decent at a 7.1 rating. 88 minutes played and 2 ground balls won, completing 44 accurate passes and 2 key passes. In the final third, his level of fluidity is so impressive. Not only able to play as an overlapping fullback, but drift into the half spaces and collect the ball like a number 8. His body feints were sending people even in the crowd, 
with a top ability to manipulate the ball. Urien Timber really has that midfielder-like ability. Having come through initially Ajax as a number 10, you can see straight away how sharp he is when he collects the ball, always being one step ahead in possession. With Ben White out for a matter of months, Timber's importance has grown that much more, and Arsenal will have to be careful. As great as Timber is on the right-hand side, having come off an ACL injury where games come a thick and fast, Mikel Arteta will have to find a way to rotate, ease the burden on Timber and use him in the games that are most important. Moving on to the fourth thing, defensive resurgence. On a day where Arsenal got a much needed win, it was also a much needed clean sheet, as David Raya kept his 15th of 2024, four more than any other team in the league. What makes that stat even funny is the fact that we hadn't kept one in seven games, yet not a single team was able to overtake us. It just goes to show, in 2024 we have the same amount of clean sheets as Liverpool and Chelsea combined. If anything, it shows just how good we were defensively prior to this season. At one point from January to April, we'd only considered a 4.98 XG, miles ahead of the likes of City, Liverpool and Tottenham. For also, the standard has been set. The defence has showcased an ability to be absolutely elite. In this game, it was back to his best, with a certain William Saliba thrive, dropping a 7.4 rating, with three clearances, one block shot and two tackles. 3 out of 4 ground balls won and 96 passes completed at a whopping 98% pass success rate. Saliba has now made 27 tackles this season. No other player has even made 15 tackles without being dribbled past. Very much a Virgil van Dijk-esque number. I actually believe Saliba has been at a very high level this season, going under the radar because of the standard that he set. The expectation is higher than ever before, but game after game is showing that he's still able to thrive. I also want to give a shout out to David Ryer and goal. Keeping his first clean sheet in 7 games, for me what I was more impressed by was his short passing, not only in accuracy but also in urgency. The amount of times from goal kicks Ryer was going short, getting off from the attack and building tempo. But if we're going to talk about the defence, I also want to talk about a player playing in front of it. We're talking Mikel Marino, dropping a 7.1 rating playing as a left number 8, completing 29 accurate passes and winning 4 out of 10 ground balls, as well as making 2 interceptions and 3 tackles. It wasn't a standout performance, but very much an underrated one doing his job in midfield and keeping the left-hand side stable, combining very well alongside Ricardo Calafuri. Trossard also had a very hit and miss game, but on that left-hand side, these two are going to be the most important, giving also that platform going forwards, whether it's going to be Martinelli or Trossard going forwards, maybe even a signing in January. With the return of Martin Odegaard, Mikel Marino is finally allowed to play in his actual position, a proper left number eight like Granite Xhaka. With the massive games that we have coming up that I obviously must win, having Marino fit and available getting more momentum will be an integral part of Arsenal's next midfield evolution. Moving on to the fifth thing, the title twist. On a day where Arsenal made it 2,000 wins in the top flight, it was actually Mikel Arteta's 250th game in charge, making it now 147 wins, 43 draws and 60 losses, 464 goals scored and a 58.6% win rate. The numbers are definitely very impressive, but what was even more impressive was the cameo of Ethan Wanier. Coming off the bench to score his first ever Premier League goal at 17 years of age, he has now become also second youngest goal scorer in Premier League history, only behind a certain Cesc Fabregas, who himself scored his first also league goal 20 years ago. 20 years later, it's all about a new stop. Ethan Wanier becoming a 10th youngest goal scorer in Premier League history, dropping an 8.0 rating off the bench in only 8 minutes, completing 11 of 11 passes, one key pass and one successful dribble. We can talk about the goal itself because it was a fantastic finish, but what was more impressive was the confidence on the ball. Bursting past players like he was in Nazar, the sidesteps, the shimmies, it was a really top cameo. And it's something that Arsenal fans have seen coming for a long time. That level of technical ability that you see from the really elite players, you can see that Wanyari has it straight away. Pure talent-wise up there with the very best in Europe. We talk about Lamine Yamal and all these other top young players. If Wanyari gets minutes at Arsenal, I truly believe he can reach a similar caliber. Having now scored his fourth goal in all competitions this season, he is Arsenal's third highest goal scorer. What we're seeing here is the birth of an inevitable talent, one that is too good not to eventually break into the starting eleven. Martin Odegaard may be back, but going into the second half of this season, Arsenal have important games in the Premier League, FA Cup and Champions League. And that's why I think Wanyeri is going to come most important. Coming on in games also needed an extra spot. Wanyeri has got that burst and killer instinct in the final third. For also themselves, it was a very successful day. Having rotated so many important players, not even used Kai Havertz or Declan Rice. So I've got the winner against an informed Forest side cannot be looked past. This was a team that have beaten Liverpool and Fulham this season. But the Emirates did and we made them look average. Looking like Man United has also completely dominated them. I can't think of a single counter-attack they really had. Alanga and Hutton Odoi fully nullified. After two performances against Inter and Chelsea that were definitely better, but not the results that we wanted, Arsenal have finally got themselves back on track. So in a title race, a lot of people were counting us out. After Man City made it five losses in a row, 
as Nando's FC smoked them four goals to nil. Of course, as Arsenal fans, we need to stay humble. When you look at Erling Haaland's numbers of two goals scored from an XG of eight, in the Premier League since telling Mikel Arteta to stay humble, Liverpool are the team on top of Man City's four league titles in a row. They were always going to be the biggest threat. But when you see them out of form with no Rodri and no Kovacic now, sitting only a point ahead of Arsenal in fourth place, who are joint with Chelsea and Brighton, Liverpool are indeed the team in command. Facing bottom of the table at Hampton tomorrow. For me, what's more intriguing is the game they have after that. Real Madrid in the Champions League, then Man City coming to Anfield. Law of averages say that Man City won't lose six games in a row. If able to take points of Liverpool, for Arsenal only can we overtake City, but even close the gap to Liverpool. Watching this performance, seeing Martin Odegaard thrive once again. A really promising right hand side with Saka and Timber. Rice and Havertz not even used. Mikel Arteta was using the squad properly. But talk to me down below in the comments what were your thoughts on the performance. And more importantly, do you think Arsenal are still in this title race? Next up for Arsenal is a game against Sporting Lisbon in the Champions League. Having just lost Ruben Amarim to Manchester United, they've got a new manager in João Pereira. And of course for Arsenal fans, all eyes are going to be on a certain Swedish striker. Could this be a Victor Jokeres audition? But that is the video there and there, so hopefully you guys have enjoyed. If you have, don't forget to smash a like and also subscribe to the channel if you are new. If you want to follow your boy on all of the social medias, then the links are down in the description. But that was the five things we learned from Arsenal 3 Nottingham Forest nil. A much needed victory on Sporting Lisbon coming up next. We've got a chance to make it two games in a row. So my friends, I will see you very soon. Take care and live it.